The first is uh, Saint Jean de Brébeuf. Saint John of Brébeuf. So you have on here, I, I'll read them for you, because Saint John of Brébeuf always have the year of his life, 1593 to 1649. Uh, he was a priest. He was a priest. And actually, he arrived in Quebec in 1625. Do you remember when we spoke about Champlain and the first uh, missionaries who came? The first were the Recollets, the Recollets. They came 1515, and they had real hardships. They had big problems with the language. There were four of them. They were scattered. It was extremely difficult. And in 1624, remember what they did in 1624? They consecrated Canada to St. Joseph. 1624. And things really change with that consecration to St. Joseph. We see right here St. John of Brebeuf arriving in 1625. Uh, arriving in Quebec the year after, the Viceroy, Henri de Lauzon, uh, Henri de Lévy, okay, Henri de Lévy, who was a member of the Company of the Blessed Sacrament, Blessed Sacrament Company, he said, we need to send Jesuits to Canada. And so St. John de Brebeuf was among the first two Jesuits who were sent in the next ship in 1625. He arrived in Quebec in 1620, August 1625. Saint John de Brebeuf was a giant. Well, he's a, in, in so many ways. He's one of the greatest missionary in the history of the church. He's at the level of Saint Francis uh, Xavier, of uh, great missionaries in the history, St. Hyacinth in Poland, and St. Augustine in, in England, St. Patrick in, in, where was St. Patrick? In Ireland, okay, St. Patrick. He's, he's great, he, he was a big man, six foot, a, uh, an ice box, we would say, in, uh, in Boite à Glace, okay. Um, and something which kept him all his life, a bit like uh, who would say St. St. Thomas Aquinas also, who was called a gentle ox. St. John of Brebeuf was huge man and gentle. And this is something the Indians had never seen. Somebody who was strong and kind. In the Gospel, in the Book of Wisdom, they apply these two attributes to God, God who reaches everything, suaviter et fortiter, in a uh, smoothly and strongly, like the sun ray reaching us, giving you a little caress on your face because you're cold and all of a sudden a bit of warmth come from that ray. But how far is the sun away from here? Okay, millions of miles, that massive planet, God is kind of remote controlling. Okay, she's cold over there. Let's give him a little caress, you know. And so, but powerful and, so, and soft or gentle. And that was his name. His name, Eshon, Ekon, E-C-H-O-N, was his Indian name, which means the great tree. The beautiful tree, like a nice oak tree in the middle of a field. Okay. Uh, because for the Indians, as for the Chinese today, as for our youth, you know, to be a man, you have to be Superman. You stop trains and you're not wounded by bullets and you fly, you know. But that's not the real strength. Because you can be conquered by your passions. 
It can be conquered by anger, by lust, by impatience. Greatness of man is not in his muscles, is in his soul. And that's why that greatness is available to everybody. A little Maria Goretti at 12 years old, 11 years old, was as great as St. John of Brebeuf when she died rather than commit a sin. That's the greatness. And so you have to understand in our story, we're going to see all eight are martyrs, so they all ended shedding their blood for the faith. But each of them has a particular trait. And St. John of Brebeuf's particular trait is that uh, greatness, a massive man, and gentleness. Which is a good image of the Sacred Heart as well. So he arrived in 1625, August 1625. And first thing he did, first thing he did was to go and spend about six months almost right away, with the Montagnais, the Cree Indians. North of Quebec, I think is around Lac Saint-Jean, that whole area. He took off in the, I don't know, September-ish. Right away, he's just freshly ordained. He was ordained, I think, the year before. And uh, he's ready to go. I want to go and spend winter with them. And don't forget, you know, there's, there's details which are not often mentioned. They're mentioned when you start reading their letters, when you go into more details, is that he was going to go alone with a group of Indians, 20, 30 Indians, going to go and live with them in the forest. He won't be able to say mass. Uh, you might say his breviary, all right. He won't be able to say mass because, first of all, there's no proper place to say mass. If you're stuck in the middle of a blizzard, if it's minus 30, uh, if you have no wine, you can't say mass. Okay, They're adjusting. Now, he's not the first one. I said this 1625. There's been priests there for 10 years. But, but he's going to go and live with you. And he was dying to go and live with them, to learn about them. And that's going to be another trait of St. John de Brebeuf. He will be the, I would say, the greatest. He goes from 1625 to 1649. He covers the longest period, 24 years. The others will be less and less and less and less and less, some even just three years. Okay? Some is very quick, two years, three years. Uh, Gabriel Allemand is, is uh, just 46 to 49, just barely two years, two and a half years. St. John of Brebeuf covered everything. So he is well known as a, an ethnologue. Ethnies are the, the nations, the people, the characteristics of the different societies. An ethnologue is somebody who's going to live with these people and analyze this people, how they live, analyze their customs, analyze, do, do they have achieves, do they have laws, how do they do their hunting, what's their religion, what they believe, do they have moral law, do they lie, do they steal, do they have polygamy, do they have monogamy. He's going to live with them to analyze these people. In the middle of this, he's going to learn their language. St. John of Brebeuf is the first uh, priest who mastered Algonquin, the Cree language, and uh, the Huron language. And he wrote books. He, so imagine the priest, you're thrown, imagine you're thrown in the middle of the Chinese, and you're the first white person among them. And they speak Chinese, and they don't speak English or French. And you have to after a while, understand what they're saying. And you're going to write a vocabulary. You start having your little, on your notebook, you know, Apple is this and this. is this. You can start 
writing your vocabulary and start building up like a little child, like in primary school, grade one, start building I, you, he, they, we, and all this, and hot and cold and all the vocabularies. How do you spell it? There's no language. Spell in your own words. So it was harder in the, uh, the Asian languages because they had their own characters. They had to learn a character, like Arabic world as well. Anyway, so, and then start understanding the grammar. Because we have a certain way of speaking. But some languages, they put the verb at the end of the sentence. Okay? On the table, beautiful plate, meat, vegetables, we put. Okay? And so you have to build up their grammar. And uh, so, and to understand in some languages, the words click in. We separate the verbs and we put the plate of vegetables on the table. Okay? So we have all these different words. But in some of the language, when you add a word, it clicks in, it adds in as a suffix or as a prefix to the word, and it makes very long words. It's spelled all in one, but actually there's a whole paragraph in that word. So the first time you hear that, you say, what did you say? You know. Oh, the house which is near the big rock on the left side of the river near the big tree. Oh, oh yeah, 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 okay. But all that is one word. Today you have, if you, you can do an, uh, an exercise of this, just do, do a little search on the Welsh language. Among today, it's one of the trivial, uh, trivial, pursuit, trivial pursuit is, what is the longest word today, 2019, these are the Welsh words are the longest. There are about 50 letters in a word. But it's actually, it's a sentence all tied together. The Thai language also have very long words. Okay, Chinese is, each sound is a syllable. So they have lots of small characters because each sound is a syllable. Anyway, so each language has its own, its own uh, philosophy. So, St. John of Brebeuf spent the first winter, 25-26, with the, the Cree Indians to try to get acclimated to this life of which he was dreaming of. And uh, which now he was experimenting. It's rough. One thing that we, we, we find out when we read his life St. John de Brebeuf was a Jesuit. Jesuit were very, very solid spirituality. And particularly on, based on humility, on the mercy of God, on my misery. I have a great debt towards the mercy of God. He has forgiven me my sins. I owe him everything. And so this whole idea of contrition and I'm going to go and have a very difficult life. It's going to be tough to live outdoors. Uh, what kind of fur coat did they have? You're sleeping in a little teepee, which is basically just bark. There's no insulation there. And St. John of Bebeuf will describe the hardships when he will start traveling to Euronia, but already he had experience, experienced the hardship of sleeping in an Indian tent when it's minus 20, 30 Celsius. Everybody wants to be close to the fire because you're freezing. But it's either, so one side of you is burning because there's a fire. The front is burning. The back is freezing. I mean, there's a change of like 40 degrees front and back. And then there's the smoke inside the hut, the teepee. You're choking to death. You've been close to a fire, you know, when it's, there's a lot of smoke. And so you end up flat, your face on the snow, trying to breathe. Then you're burning on one side and you're freezing on the other side and you're choking in the middle, okay? And you have to sleep like this all night. That's the winter. The summer is then the mosquitoes. And mosquitoes in these days were jumbos. You could eat, you know, mosquito legs, you know, so they were full of meat, you know. So 
mosquitoes. They were awful. So he spends that first winter with the, the, uh, the Cree Indians. Comes back to Quebec. So Quebec is, we're talking 1926. There's, I'm not sure if there's 50 people in Quebec. Champlain's there. There's the famous Habitation of Champlain. It's really the beginning. And right away, uh, St. John of Abeuf is sent to Euronia. Euronia, okay, which we see here. This is Euronia. Uh, pas, uh, Alexandre, c'est pas trop brillant. Okay. Uh, okay. So, there's, if you know a bit of Ontario, okay, there's Barry here in the south. Okay. Toronto is just below the map. Midland is over here. Okay, Aurelia is over here. So we have a chapel in Aurelia. Okay, and uh, so we have some people living near, near Lake Sim Simcoe on this side. When we do the pilgrimage every year, we start from Aurelia and we walk, uh, I think we walk probably around along the road there this way. And we have mass at St. Ignace too, there. That's where St. John de Brebeuf died. So you can see, uh, if the camera zooms in, all the names in red are the various missions the Jesuit founded in this whole place of Euronia. And Caragua, where the first mass was said, is right there. Okay, Father Le Caron said there. So. It's interesting to see that we have, for example, we have St. Joseph I and we have St. Joseph II. They had such a great devotion to St. Joseph. They said, well, I wanted to call it St. Joseph as well. So I'll call it St. Joseph II. We have St. Mary's I, St. Mary's II, St. Ignatius I, St. Ignatius II. St. Anne, St. John, St. Marie, St. Charles. Okay, we have St. Jean Baptiste. So that is Euronia. Now, so he's sent there. From, uh, let's go back a little bit here. Okay, I'm going to go back to the, his timeline. He's going to be there from two, first, he's going to make two trips. He's going to make three trips in Euronia. First trip is 26 to 29. So he sent with the Euron to live with the Eurons and He's going to deepen their language. He's going to try to understand, but zero baptism. You have to understand, he's a priest. He wants to save souls. But before you can actually get to them, you must get them to, in a way, admire you and impress something on them and show that you are as tough as them and you, are, uh, you have something that they don't know. You come to give them the good news, the gospel. But that's tough because you need to talk the language. In many of these, these uh, missionaries' lives, we see that they had problem finding a word for God. What word do you have in your language for God? What does the word God mean? The Great Spirit? The creator, or does it mean the, the one who rules the universe? Or the there's all the different nuance of the language, which uh, the missionary has to he must not rush to give names. He has to understand the different ways of saying something and trying to find. And if there's not a word, then you need to tell them, well, that supreme being, which is all perfect, all holy, eternal, all powerful. It's called Deus. I use a Latin word. Deus. They did that in Asia. Francis Xavier did that in, in, uh, in India and in Japan as well. So, so 26 to 29, St. John of Rebeuf is moving around Euronia. 29, he has to come back to Quebec. And soon after he comes back to Quebec, the British fleet arrive in front of Quebec, 
with the Kirk brothers. And they, they arrive in 28, actually. 29, they actually succeed. They make everybody prisoner, go back to Europe. Champlain included. And so, and St. John of Brebeuf writes in his memoirs, he says, I failed. I failed. I'm not worthy to be a missionary here in New France. I'm not worthy. It's because of my sins that God says, you're not good enough, go home. And it's amazing to see the humility of these men who were you know, champions, really. Anyway, they go home. He with the other, the other priest and whoever was in Quebec, the English take over Quebec. 29, 30. By the time they arrive in England, they find out, the English found out that the British have lost a battle to the French. And as part of the, the, uh, the spoils of the battle, they have to give all their prisoners back. So all the French go back to France. And, but now it takes a while. Champlain, who is among them, Champlain has, prepares another expedition. And eventually, they come back in 33. In 33, they come back. And so de Brebeuf, I think it's about that time, de Brebeuf is, uh, uh, becomes a superior of, the superior of the mission. There, okay. His first r role as superior of uh, Euronia was to establish a center. There's a few priests. So how are we going to operate in this whole zone? So the center was St. Joseph I, which is uh, St. Joseph II, Ignace I. St. Joseph I is there. The Joachim, okay. It's around there, St. Joseph I. And he said, we're going to start there, and the missionaries will go out to the different villages, try to find out, well, with a little bit of language that we have, try to learn new words, try to live with them, try to get them to accept you, and then come back in two months. Then would come back, and then they share notes. Oh, I learned a new way to say this. Oh, these words mean this. And start got to vocabulary, and they start sharing their experience, and they're, they're learning the language. You have to learn with the children. You know, and you have to, uh, have to learn everything. Okay? So, but one thing that happened during that time, 60, 34, 35, 36, the missionaries come in. There's also epidemics that come because the white men come. And these bugs, they can be in the clothes, they can be in the gar, in the gar, in the uh, luggage. They can be, because they're coming from Quebec where ships have come from Europe. From, so you have a big case that came from the ports in, in Europe. There can be some disease, some bugs there gets on the ship, gets in the canoe, and is brought to the villages. And the epidemic starts spreading. And it's the first time ever that they're having these epidemics, smallpox or whatever they have. St. John Webeuf says, uh, in 30, so in 34 was smallpox with dysentery, 36 malignant influenza, 39 smallpox, the population of the Eurons were 30,000. It went down to 12,000. And so the witch doctors, they say, these black robes, they're bringing death. It's their fault. They say we're teaching you a religion of life, but actually they're killing our people. And so there's a lot of, of uh, tension, a lot of difficulties, missionaries are expelled, go away, go away. And they're wandering around. 
uh, a number of times. Don't forget, they're not hunt. There's no guns to hunt. I mean, they they have to beg for their food. They might eat bark of the trees or blueberries or berries they find in, in the snow in winter. It's rough. It's rough. And so there's a whole campaign against them. In, 19, in 1637, the whole mission almost collapses. And there's, a, there's an interesting story where this one day, the missionaries heard that they're going to be slaughtered that night. There are three or four of them in this hut, their little hut. Now, there's a custom among the Hurons. If you're dying, maybe dying of a disease, you're, you're sick, whatever, before you die, you give a banquet to everybody in the village. That's your farewell party. And so the missionaries, they wrote to Father Lejeune, who was the superior then. They say, dear father, I think we've come to the end. We might be murdered, martyred tonight. They wrote a long letter to tell the situation where they're at. It's critical. And they give the letter to some uh, Christian who takes off to go to deliver the letter. And so the priest invites everybody in the village for a banquet, the death banquet. And they really feed them royally. And the missionaries are very calm. They're actually happy. They're going to die. Go to heaven. Going to heaven tonight. Let's celebrate. They were so calm, and they had, these people in their huts were planning to smack their head, chop their head off. That's what they were thinking when they were coming to the meal. They came to the meal, and they saw this banquet as best the priest could do. The missionaries, very peaceful, happy, calm. Their calm was so impressive that the Euron changed their minds now where these guys are not afraid. They're not afraid. And they, they, they did not slaughter them that night. 1638, we have a new superior, Father Vimont. We came across, uh, we came across him in the, in the previous talk. He was the priest who first said Mass in Montreal with Maisonneuve and Jeanne Mans, Vimont, V-I-M-O-N-T, Vimont. And he will change. So Father de Brebeuf then passes on the, uh, the leadership to Father Vimont. It's normal in religious communities. It's like we have Bishop Fellet and now Father Pagliarani. Okay, you had different superiors of Canada and one day I'll go and someone else will come. So we have, it's normal in the religious life. So Father Vimont arrives and he says, okay, we're going to change the tactics. Instead of having one center and the missionaries go out to the different villages, come back. In 1639, he said, we're going to create a Christian village. And they called it St. Mary among the Huron. So that was a strategy of the missionary. So that's in Midlands, okay, Midlands, uh, or Midlands, right there, okay, Midlands, St. Mary the Huron, there's St. Mary right there, okay. So St. Mary among the Hurons became, instead of going to, the, to them, we will bring them to us. We would like to show them what Catholic life is, because they don't know. They just see the priest. They don't see a family. They don't see kids. They don't see people going to Mass. They don't see an organization where we have Mass, you're going to have breakfast, you get back together, and then the carpenters, the, uh, the tailors, the blacksmith, the, uh, the gardeners, everybody go and do their chores, and then they go for lunch, come back in the evening and meet again, they say the rosary in a chapel, a Christian life. They've never seen this, ever. They don't understand what you're talking about. So they don't understand the words. We will show them visibly. So St. Mary among the Hurons was that. 
was a, a, uh, a showcase of Catholic life. And there were not many, there were maybe 20 people there. Okay? The one who, who did St. Mary of the Huron was the one who was in charge with organizing everything was St. Isaac Jobes. It was not St. John of Bordeaux. We'll speak about this later on. At that time, Saint uh, uh, Isaac, Saint John of Brebeuf, we, we finished. It, let's finish with him. Saint John of Brebeuf leaves the area around Midland and goes south to the Neutrals, the Indian, the tribe, Indian tribe called the Neutrals. That's near uh, Saint Catherine, Niagara Falls, that whole southern Ontario. And it's very tough because they say, well. The Hurons are all uh, set up against us. Let's try some other tribes. But the problem was, because the Hurons were not converted yet. First baptism was, it took three years for the first baptism. 1636. Okay. And at first it was just drop by drop. With St. Mary of the Hurons, in 10 years from 1639, to 1649, they baptized 10,000 people. It really worked. Okay, but we're not there yet. We're at the beginning, and it's it's very arid apostolate. So Saint John of Brebeuf, with another priest, I forget, I think it was Father Chomono, or one of them, go south to see if they can reach other tribes. But unknown to them, the Huron have sent some spies ahead of them to tell the other tribes, the black robes are coming, they carry death. You are gonna die, don't listen to them. They're worse witch doctors. And so when they arrive in the villages, they're pushed back, they're not welcome. And it's by the grace of God that they survive these about five months wandering around the forest of Southern Ontario, Southern Toronto. Eventually, uh, they say it's not working. Uh, failures, missionaries have hit failures. And they say, let's go back up. And on the way up, as he's walking towards, say, to the, to, to today's Toronto, as St. John of Brebeuf, they're crossing a lake, and St. John of Brebeuf slips and actually fractures his shoulder bone. It is so bad. He tells it, and his companion, his companion as well, that for a long while, I'm talking about, I don't know, maybe kilometers, he had to walk on his floor. He could not walk anymore. It was too painful. So we're just crawling on the ice, just moving, just moving. Just imagine this big man with his, don't forget, they carry everything with them. They don't have roller bags, okay, like we have today. They have to carry their clothes. They have to carry maybe a few books, a breviary. They have a bit of food. What do you eat? There's no restaurant, no shops, nothing. You're in the middle of a frozen lake. Okay, so. And it's only many, many months later when they eventually arrive in Quebec that they saw it was a broken shoulder bone. Okay. And he had never complained, never complained about this. In 16, uh, 1641, he comes back to Quebec. And he's going to be in Quebec, 41, 42, 43. And uh, 42, 42, he arrives in Quebec after seven years with the Hurons. 42, the year of the foundation of Montreal. 42, Saint Marie of the Incarnation is there in the Ursuline convent. Remember, she arrived and she built that convent. That's the, I think it was autumn 42 that they finished building their, the first Ursuline convent. So Saint John of Brebeuf is among, among these first ones right now saying mass for these nuns, spiritual direction, preaching to them. So there are saints living there in Quebec. And Maison arrives, Jeanne Mance arrives, he witnesses the foundation of, 
the foundation of Montreal, Ville Marie. And uh, he was given the task of being procurators for the Huron missions, which is to supply the missionaries with everything they need. Don't forget, one of the big role of the missionaries is to learn the language, to teach the language to the young missionaries who are arriving. So St. John Abueva will have to go back to the school teacher and teach the young priest how to speak the language. What fort how fortunate they were to have a teacher who had pierced the language. St. John will also write an instruction for missionaries. How to be a missionary. And he says, follow me. Follow what I'm telling you. Because if you want to be successful, uh, you, have, you have to know a number of things. He had studied the, the psychology of these people. Don't upset them in any way. When you get in the canoe, and it's all in the document you, which you can find, when you get in the canoe, don't bring any sand in the canoe. Make sure your feet are clean. Okay. And once the canoe takes off, you're going to take a position in the canoe and be ready to be sitting or kneeling there for 10 hours, 12 hours without moving. Take a position and get ready. If you want to row, to paddle, paddle. And if you think it's going too slow and you ask one of them, can I help you? Be aware, if you start paddling, you're going to have to paddle all day. And you cannot say, well, I'm tired now. No, no, it's going to be 12 hours. And uh, don't make any moves in, in the canoe, because there's four or five men in these big canoes. Because if you make them upset, they might bring the canoe next to a rock and say, get out. And it continue in the middle of the river. And he, ex he explains, he says, you know, and he was a big guy, you know, 200 pounds maybe, so he had to be extremely careful. And also another thing is, is don't think that you're going to be paddling for hours on a gentle river, the, the, the Utah River and then all the French River and all these rivers. Don't think you can learn the language during that time. They don't want to talk. You have to keep silence, not a word. How do you say, no, no, how do you... And so just paddle or just stay there and meditate and pray and do whatever you want, but don't move. It's a very interesting uh, instruction he wrote. These trips from Quebec to Midlands were about 30, 35 days long. There were, I think, about 40 portages. A portage means there's some uh, rapids you have to land, uh, uh, empty the whole canoe, walk through the forest to the other side of the rapids where the water is calm. And there's no trails, it's bushes, mosquitoes. You're barefoot walking in a forest. Make a trip. And they're, they're, these guys are strong. These are Indians. They've done that so many times. They're screaming at you, hurry up, hurry up. You have to carry 30, 40, 50 pounds stuff. And so, and you slip and you damage your leg, you keep walking, there's no stopping. It happened in one of the stories of the gray nuns. The gray nuns had to do it too when they went west, that one of the sisters slipped and broke her leg, fell in the water, you know, and they were women. So they had, the Indians never had this white woman traveling with them. And so some of the, uh, the men in the canoe says, we're just going to leave her here. We have to go. We have to go. And the other sister says, no way. No way. She's coming along. And we're going to help her. And anyway, and she had to continue the Quebec to Winnipeg with a broken leg. And don't, don't forget, if it's raining, you're all wet. You're going to stay wet for a week until it dries on you. Okay? Just imagine the hardships of these missionaries. So... 
We have written in one of the issue of the Carillon in French, we have written uh, the story of, of from the notes of St. John of Brebeuf. It's tough, okay? So, he's back in Quebec, 1644. In September, he's back into Huron countries, and he's going to be there for the next five years, 44 to 49. And let me end up his uh, story in 49. Uh, 49, Saint, uh, Saint John is in the, the village of Saint Louis, right there, Saint Louis. And March 16, March 16, 1649, a thousand Mohawks, Iroquois, arrive, surround the village. Saint Gabriel Lallemand is there, and Saint John de Brebeuf. And they're stripped naked, and they have to walk about 10 kilometers. It's March, and there's snow, they're barefoot. They have to walk to Ignace II, Saint Ignace II, which is there, right there, this one there. And, and there, first, Saint John de Brebeuf will be tortured from about 2 p.m. to 6 p.m., tortured, like, as I say, like uh, few saints have been tortured. They tied him to a post. First, they, of course, they chew all his fingers away. First thing they do, so they have no fingernails. You can, you cannot hurt. So remove, they bite all the fingers off. Then they give him a necklace of, uh, of uh, hatchet heads, okay, uh, axe heads, red hot. They put in the fire. They put kind of a branch or a wire or something. And they give him in front and in the back. So if he leans backward, forward, it's burning his back. If he leans forward, it's burning the front. They partially, partially scalp him. They put charcoal on his head. Then uh, one of the Mohawks, actually it was a Huron, who had been baptized, who had abandoned the faith and joined the stronger tribe, and was torturing him. I say, hey, Father, you want to be baptized? And so they take a bucket of boiling water, and they baptize him with boiling hot water. They, they cut him on the side. They cut his thigh four hours like this. And what was the most extraordinary is that St. John was stronger than them. For the, these people, these, these natives, as we said at the beginning, strength was in, in, uh, in, in physical strength. And St. John of Brebeuf was never, not a word of complaint. There were other people in that long hut watching him. He was encouraging them. So they cut his lips, they cut his nose. Okay. They even took a, a burning uh, piece of wood from the fire, plucking it in his mouth because he was encouraging them to pray. Okay. But after four hours of that horrible torture, he was still stronger than them. He, at one stage, he almost collapsed. He was standing. He collapsed because it was, it was too much. And one of the, the Indians took his knife. He says, where does this man get his strength from? And they say, I want, to be as, I want to be as strong as him. So one of them just uh, stabbed him at the heart, opened the heart to eat his heart. That's how he died. But it's beautiful if you put that spiritually. Here's a, what we call them, the savages. Savages in these days are just uncivilized. It was rough. But this, this, this Indian who's beaten, defeated by this giant gentleman, not complaining, he's, being, he's been burned alive. There was not a spot on his body that was not burned. They say, those who witnessed this, they say they would take charcoal, put it all over his body. There was black smoke going up, a bit like a grain of incense during Mass, being consumed for the sacrifice. And, but you see, they were so impressed, and they thought his strength was in his heart. When we go to Mass, 
we receive communion, we communicate to the sacred heart. It's the same. We do it supernaturally, spiritually. And that's how he died. Uh, St. John of Brebeuf. Just one more thing about him. About him. So he died March 16, 1649. We will have a further talk. We we'll probably will talk about uh, Venerable Catherine of St. Augustin. She's a nun who arrived in, I think she arrived in 46, 47 in Quebec. A little girl, about uh, 15 years old. And by the time uh, she was then a, a professed nun, in 1662, St. John of Brebeuf started appearing to her in Quebec and became her spiritual director for from 1662 till 1668 when she died. And she would write all this to Bishop de Laval, Monseigneur de Laval, who was there, the Bishop of Quebec. He knew what was going on. She was a little bit like, she's our Catherine de Sienne. St. Catherine of Siena in Canada is both Marie de l'Incarnation and Catherine of St. Augustine. But in 1663, St. John Brebeuf appears, and, and Catherine of St. Augustine hears this. God wants to use him to protect this country, and those who will have recourse to him will feel a powerful help from him. So God wants to use St. John Brebeuf as the guardian, as the protector of this country. That's why we should invoke him more often. We don't invoke enough the Canadian martyrs. Here is his uh, relics in Midlands. It's actually half of his skull is authentic. And uh, Alexandre, okay, half of his skull is there. The other half is in Quebec. They they redid the skull with uh, a, a fake skull, but. Uh, if we go to the pilgrimage, we can see this. So, let's move on to the second one. 